Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for sharing the um, So I'm going to talk today about work I've been doing over the last, um, well, specifically with the guitar over just for just over a year, but I, but more generally with acoustic instruments, I've been doing for quite a long time, looking at um, interactive ways of engaging with electronics uh, from a performer's point of view. So specifically for the guitar, I've been looking at ways of uh, controlling the electronic part um, in a way that is as unobtrusive as possible. I suppose it follows on a little bit from uh, the chime talk that we've just had as well. So I've been looking at ways of using um, the, the instrument itself as a way of controlling the electronics is, is my idea. So no foot switches, no kind of motion sensors, uh, no you know little pads on the guitar or anything like that, but just the guitar is going to control the electronics. That, that is my idea. And um, I've been experimenting with pitch tracking algorithms as a way of uh, doing this. You know, I've got other strategies in my head that I'm going to um, be looking at as well, sort of very discrete movement sensors and things like this. But I've been working with uh, pitch tracking alg algorithms in SuperCollider so that we're just using the sound of the acoustic instrument, the trigger events in the um, electronic part. So that, that's where I'm coming from with this. Um, so also the idea in the composition is to use the source material of the guitar in real time to create the electronic part as well. So it's sort of interactive in that sense as well. <laughs> so the idea then is to have a, as minimal an interface as possible. I am absolutely not a Luddite. I love being surrounded by foot switches and pedals and wires and all these things. But I also find it frustrating sometimes, and it does seem to dominate the performance sometimes, the sort of extended um, instrument and so on. And um, so the idea is then to just try and as much as possible use the existing skill set of the guitarist as a way of, you know, controlling the electronic part. So a little bit of background about me. I'm a guitarist. Uh, to a lesser extent, I'm a piano player, I'm a composer. Uh, academically, at least, what I do is I work with acoustic instruments and electronics. And to do that, I've been using Macs. And more recently, in the last five years or so, I've been using Super Collider as well. And as I think about these things that I do in my practice, uh, there are themes that seem to interest me, which um, come out of this. And these themes seem to be the boundaries and the connections that exist uh, between these sort of, what would you call them, sort of polarities, or what you might want to call them. So between the acoustic and the electronic, boundaries and connections between the composer and the performer and the instrument maker, uh, notation versus improvisation and the listener, you know, what separates these things and um, what ties them together is what I'm interested in exploring in my work. So if we think about uh, boundaries and connections existing between the acoustic instrument and the electronic instrument, I think they're fairly well documented, but they're worth uh, discussing again. An acoustic instrument, a classical guitar, in this case, a nylon string guitar. Um, it exists in primarily, and with a great many exceptions, it's, it's a sort of note-based sound world. And I put sound world in big inverted commas there because it's, it's such a weird phrase, isn't it? A sound world, a sort of, you know, the world that the guitar inhabits. But it tends to be note-based. It comes from a long tradition of performance practice. There's a lot to, you know, there's a lot of history behind it, cultural baggage, as David Cotter called it this morning. Um, there's a lot of repertoire for the instrument. Um, there is a lot of, um, you know, 
established techniques, including sort of extended techniques, which we don't really think of as extended techniques. That is part of the established vocabulary of a modern player. It has a fixed interface. You know, you're not going to change it too dramatically. And then possibly most importantly is this direct mapping, of course, that exists between the physical gesture and the sound. You know, you do something and it produces a sound. The electronic instrument is very different from that, of course. Um, it inhabits, you know, in, in this context at least, and with a great many exceptions, what we might call the texture-based sound world, to use the uh, scare quotes again. Electronic instruments have a relatively brief tradition of performance practices. Um, new instruments, new interfaces and so on are being developed all the time. Uh, and they, they may well have no tradition at all. Probably they do, probably they relate to something else, but they may well have no tradition whatsoever. And a new instrument may have no or a very limited repertoire of techniques. And of course, there's going to be no direct mapping of physical gestures to sound. It's an arbitrary mapping that occurs there. Um, so I'm also interested in the boundaries and connections between these traditional roles, the role of the composer, the instrument designer, the performer and the listener, because when I think about it, that's me. I'm all of those people when I'm creating my work, I'm writing the music, I'm also designing the instrument, but that's sort of part of writing the, the music as well. You know, there's a, there's a great blurring between me building my super glider patch and um, me uh, composing things in Sibelius and me freely improvising. I'm also playing the pieces very often, either on my own or in collaboration with other people. <laughs> And I'm also the listener as well. So these are all things uh, that interest me and that become themes in my work. I'm also very interested, just from my own approaches, in the relationships between uh, fixed notation and improvisation. I love working with Sibelius. I love notes on staves. I also improvise a lot. I improvise a lot with electronics, I improvise a lot just with notes on the guitar and finding ways to marry these two things together in the same position is also uh, very interesting to me. Um, I'm also extremely interested in control and um, finding an aesthetically satisfactory sense of cohesion uh, between the acoustic instrument and well, between the acoustic and the electroacoustic, you know, marrying these two things together in a coherent way. Um, thinking about control, thinking about the way we uh, <coughs> manipulate the electronics brings uh, questions about, you know, the role of the performer in all this. I think a lot of times people, especially if they're not performing the music themselves, if they're writing it for someone else, they don't really consider uh, the role of the performer in this. But I think it's it's really interesting to try and encourage the performer to interact with the electronic part. I think that can be very challenging. I do a lot of music at conferences like this one. You might have an hour to rehearse if you're lucky. <laughs> um, someone, you know, if you go to a big conference, they will have paid someone to play your piece. You will have sent it to them a few months before. They will have learnt it. If you're lucky, and they will they will do it for you, and it might just not have that thing that you were hoping it had, and you just haven't got the time to, you know, to work with them. So I think I think ways of encouraging performers to interact with the electronic part in, you know, in a in a real world setting is something that interests me very much as well. Um, I've certainly written electronic pieces which are supposed to be interactive where I felt that um, the performer was ticking the boxes, but not really doing what I was hoping they would do. It's like they are interacting with it, but not to the extent that I was hoping they would. Um, it's all about also creating a continuum. 
between fixed composition and improvisation, trying to fit that into the same piece as well. I use microsound a lot in a lot of my work, granular synthesis and techniques like this. And I also think it's really useful and interesting to use the acoustic part as source material for the electronic part. That um, creates a continuum as well. Um, and to do that, I've been developing non-standard notation and mixing it with traditional notation on the same score. And I've been working with structures as well to highlight the similarities and differences that exist between the acoustic and the um, electronic. Um, let me play you some examples or show you some examples of my previous work that I've been doing that have led me to this. So a piece I wrote back in 2015, one of my earliest experiments uh, with this interactive approach is a piece called With Time, Not in Time, <laughs> excuse me, uh, which I wrote for bass, clarinet, piano and live electronics. Um, it was recorded by Sarah Watts, who was here earlier on with her score duo back over at Keel University. And um, let me just play you a little bit of that just to give you give you an idea. <laughs> So there we go, that's a, a brief excerpt of that piece. Hang on, there we go. That's the interface I created for it in Max. That was what the, uh, that's what I was hoping that the uh, uh, performer would see and would interact with. It's quite clunky, it's quite naive, I think, looking back on it. Uh, the idea was that um, they would play a trigger note that would trigger something in the electronics. It would start recording into a buffer. Uh, the performer could see when the buffer was full in real time. The performer could see the notes they were playing and would be able to tell whether they hit the trigger note or not. And the performer would see all these um, these things would light up at the performer when a certain thing happens. So if you played the right trigger note, that would flash to tell you that you've done the right thing and um, you know everything would be going to plan. But it, it, it's it's quite a lot to take in for the performer. And um, Sarah played it wonderfully, but you know didn't really, understandably, I think, um, sort of engage with it to the to the extent that I was expecting her to engage with it. Um, because there's too much information, I think, there. That's the score. That's an extract from the score for it. So there were fixed notation pieces written very traditionally, but um, this is the piano line, so it's got some extended techniques. Uh, they're written in blocks to encourage uh, improvisation. The idea is this is the electronic part of the bottom, which lasts for a minute or so, and then this is a gesture to play as a sort of signal to the piano player to move on to the next bit. Again, it's sort of, it's sort of clunky, really, not, not very satisfactory. Um, so moving ahead a bit, this is a piece I wrote called The Sea Turns Sand to Stone, uh, which I wrote for the Bangor University New Music Festival. And it won a prize, I'm very happy to say, the William Matthias Composition Prize. Well done, me. Um, <laughs> This is, this is an extract from that. It's for flute, bass, clarinet, piano, and live electronics. So here's a little bit of that. 
So there we are. Um, that's a little schematic of the electronic part. Again, it's using the the uh, the sounds of the acoustic instrument in real time to create the electronic part. That's the idea to, to create this sort of sense of unity between uh, the two. That's an excerpt from the score. <coughs> These are uh, cues to show the performer that something's going to happen when they uh, do something here. This is a sort of representation, a graphic representation of what's happening in the electronic part, a sort of, you know, that's time stretching. So that's just sort of trying to do what a uh, traditional notation does, which is very, very, very simply convey, you know, complex sounds. Um, so I think I think that was better, really. I think the musicians engaged with that one in a, in a more satisfactory way. I think they engaged with it in a more satisfactory way because there was less for them to do, to be honest. They just had to, you know, pretty much play the score and the electronics looked after themselves. Um, I also worked uh, with Matthäus Müller in Zurich. And many of you may know Matthäus Müller and his Sabre bass clarinet system, which Saurabh, who was here earlier, has also done a lot of work with Matthäus on that. And Matthäus has developed a, an interactive bass clarinet system, um, which is marvellous. Uh, and I wrote a piece for him. It was performed in 2017. Uh, let me just play a little bit of that. I'm just looking at my watch so I don't keep on the right side of Jason. Um, here we go. So that, that was um, great to be involved with that. Uh, Matthias engaged with the electronics, absolutely. That's that's kind of his thing and his interest. Um, 
<laughs> so it's a communic it's a bass clarinet which communicates wire wirelessly to the computer something he's been working on for several years now at the University of the Arts in Zurich. It's got various sensors and movement sensors and so on. Um, that's a schematic of the electronic part. Uh, but more interestingly for us today, all uh, Matthias needed to see was a sort of C number to tell him where he was in the score. These are some extended techniques that I uh, built into the notation. And then in the score, there were like three lines. There's the traditional notation. These are sort of graphic representations of what you should be hearing in the electronic part. And then these are sort of movement gestures that I'm hoping he will do. You can see in that video that he is actually he's actually going for it. He's doing those things and, and it worked. So, you know, that's that's very good. Uh, there's an example of some of the graphic notations that I've been using. Um, Something else that I've been using to try and create a sense of cohesion between the acoustic and the electronic is uh, structure. Um, I wrote a piece for six instruments and electronics called Displaced Light, um, where structure played a big part in uh, you know, creating this sense of cohesion. It was very much inspired by Kaya Sariaho and some of her works. And I was creating kind of uh, continuums between various you know, polarities, like pure sound and noise is the one that we can see here. So pure sound is sort of you know consonance in inverted commas, and noise is dissonance in inverted commas. And um, you know the piece has this sort of arc where the, the noise wins out to the middle, and then the pure sound starts to win out towards the end. And that that's uh, another way I've been trying to create cohesion in the music by building, you know, natural tensions in the way that traditional harmony does, but with um, uh, but with other elements. Let me skip that. I'm just aware of the time. So working with the classical guitar and electronics. Um, Why have I been doing it? Uh, well, I've been, I'm very interested in uh, humanizing the technology, I guess, giving the power back to the performer if it's ever been taken away. And I think in some cases it has been taken away. I think there's an ethical dimension to that. I think it's important to keep the human at the center and not the machine or, or the, you know, the corporation that's making the machine. I think we should resist any tendencies for technologies to dehumanize us. Um, I think we should put human agency at the heart of any performance. And I think um, Jason may disagree, but I think a human will react differently to an algorithm. I think we're a long way off having an algorithm that will react in the same way that a human <coughs> will. You know. um, so what does a classical guitarist bring to the electronic music? Well, it puts human agency at the heart of the process. The classical guitar brings a rich history of performance practices and cultural inheritance, which is a good thing, I think. Um, the classical guitarist brings a broad range of instrumental gestures developed over you know, years, if not decades of practice. Uh, the classical guitar brings a, a limited but recognizable uh, range of sounds, which can be juxtaposed with the acousmatic elements and um, a familiar sound world, something to hold on to, um, which can be manipulated, reframed and recontextualized, which will allow us to blur the boundaries between the possible and the impossible. And just to finish with, um, let me just play you a little bit of me just improvising with my super collider patch. I'll jump to a random place in the middle and just give you a little bit of that to finish with. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because it takes a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 
There we go. So I think I'm out of time. So thank, thank you very much. Got five minutes for questions. We just got to put in a plug for one of our recently completed PhD students. Oh, great. Also grappling with some of the questions. I think you're coming from the composer side, wanting this certain character act interactivity. Interactive engagement part of the performer. She is a uh, performer, bass clarinetist, who's done a lot of various kinds of electronics. And her PhD was really looking deeply at how these kinds of scenarios impact the musicianship and how it can optimize the sense of real relationship that the performer can have. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very fun piece of work and <laughs> very useful to us as composers to understand these kinds of problems. I'd, I'd love to see that. So, uh, she's definitely more fun work. Yeah, I mean, the second quarter is not a super it, it was about uh, in direct collaboration, uh, developing the patch so that the virtuosity is in the hands of the performer. Uh, but it's that's a that's a gross oversimplification <laughs> of what's there. And the number of collaborative works that uh, evolved during this journey uh, to prove. The hypothesis uh, was extraordinary. Nice. I mean, she's in the same category as your guy and, and Twistle and, and, and Sarah today. Mm -hmm. uh, she she studied the Potty Spot Nine, as you both know, who's sort of like the guy that made the bass clarinet famous for new music. Uh, but it's a, it's absolutely sterling PhD. But what is that? But that rightly said, so exceptional is um, the collaborative process, which of course is not necessarily portable to performers in general because everybody has different experiences. But knowing that a performer can really uh, be in charge of what they're dealing with technically during performance. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought what a valid subject. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, you're completely engaged in it. And you were critical about the early work and what was presented to the performers. Uh, but I think, yeah, you'd like to uh, read what she's written, but I think she'd like to, you know, hear about what you've been doing. I, I would I would love to read more about that. Yeah, she does. I could maybe get her email or copy or something like that in some context. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good. A minute. Yes. The C10 sound has got nothing to do with human computer interaction. The, the, the sound world of what the instruments was doing is kind of brushing quite close to some of Ravel's stuff. I was just wondering oh, if, right. if, if there was any either, and you know, the seat turned sound to the one. That's sort of, I, 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 where did the notes come from? Uh, the notes came from, well, first of all, me improvising on the piano and then writing them down and then sort of manipulating them and changing them using various processes. So coming up with what I thought were interesting chords and then transforming those interesting chords and then bringing them back again. The title I was interested very in. Very luminous. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The title is all to do with sort of geological time and you know, granular synthesis and things like this. Because we know that the, you know, Sea turns stone to sand. And everyone knows that, but it also turns sand back into stone yeah. Yeah. over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, okay, so um, my presentation is probably a little bit of uh, listening, but uh, from a slightly different perspective from listening, from the virtuosity of listening to music composition. So I will talk more about sound in the context of um, sound and documentary filmmaking. And that's why my PhD um, is being developed to practice based research. Mark is one of my supervisors. Uh, um, I'm in the second year now, and the idea is to explore three different acts of listening from the perspective of contemporary sound studies, sound art discourse, and apply it to a filmmaking process. Um, yeah, so let's just jump from the presentation. Um, yeah, before that, just to contextualize, so my background came from as well a musician, but I became very interested in the social political dimensions and the aesthetic dimensions of sound in the last few years, working in sound installation, radio art, um, and sound for films. And I think that would re reflect the idea of what I'm trying to talk and trying to explore with the idea of listening as a methodological process for practice based research in documentary. So, actually, listening as a strategy to amplify ambience. Um, yeah, uh, my research aims to investigate how sound might be channeled, received, and articulated in contemporary documentary film. It aims to review new ways of thinking about the aesthetic and political potential of sound in no fiction filmmaking by exploring the sonic landscape of sound uh, beyond conventional studies of audiovisual relationships. This draws an extent of reflections how sonic methodologies such as listening, perhaps field recordings, and uh, mixing sound design can be extended by um, and articulated by standard sonic thinking through the concept of documentary through um, creative possibilities on sound design. In that sense, um, based on some theoretical framework, I think I'm going to jump that. Uh, but just to give an idea, for example, uh, Brandon Labelle is a um, very important conceptual framework in the acoustic territory as a critical framework for engaging parts of listening and to foreground ambience as a static uh, experience of fiction filmmaking. So the idea of amplifying ambience in the acoustic environment as um, a static testimonial material documentary. Also, Stephen Feld, um, well, very interesting from my research, the idea of acoustomology or acoustic plus epistemology and uh, sound, the foreground experience of sound as a way of knowing, as a way of knowledge. And also, the social political dimension of sound from a book, The Logical Possibility of Sound from Salome Vogelin, is also important to reference for my research. By doing that, obvious, by obvious reasons, in um, some ways, challenging the traditions of documentary filmmaking, uh, which is historically being organized with the idea of visual evidence, voice exposition, auditory testimony. Just to contextualize about what means by documentary, that's a huge topic of discussion, but um, basically, documentary film um, has been a longer part of framing simulation knowledge about subject matter. It has been historic emphasized visual representation of events and situations. Transmitted by through its, voice, through its voice, which has been perceived responsibility to notion of authenticity, which of course has been well known territory for controversy. But the point here, according to Bill Nichols, is that evidence is constructed by questioning facts and events, generate argumentative discourse to answer specific questions, and by doing that, the documentary's voice provides evidence to the persuasive rhetorical position of the filmmaker, primarily supported by visual representation. However, the documentary promotes and validates the subject matter in a certain voice, but also choose what to exclude when structure its material, according to Murrow, 2019. In that sense, sound and its diffusive capacity has the potential to disorient those dominant gaze um, and voices in an intergenerative process of listening, which at the same time offer the perspective around and beyond that of visual representation. By placing ourselves in the world, we can hear all the sound around us simultaneously. And different information is constantly being communicated at the same time. This diffuse way of perceiving the world can offer the opportunity to critique this culturally oriented gaze, its colonial histories, which has been consistently been supported by the supposed objectives of knowledge production and transmission in documentary films. Leaving the certainty behind, move us to the arena of radical uncertainty, which remains open to all contingents of historical interpretation. Back to the politics and politics of listening, uh, acoustic resistance. 
in order to address my research questions in the metabolism that you propose, uh, the outcome of my research is a documentary film. I'm working at the moment, so as I'm producing a documentary, uh, I'm not a filmmaker myself, so I rely on collaboration. In this documentary, a documentary about a place that I live at the moment, over five years now, uh, Beckham, <laughs> the uh, place in South East Londo, and very famous for its hybrid multi-layer community space. Uh, when music play a very important role in the street and the cultural, local cultural um, elements of the sonic landscape, such as, you know, every single corner had loudspeakers being played on, on, on street, on, on every single corner, and this kind of live music and sound environment, negotiating for the infrastructures, vibrations, not train noise, and, and so on. It's basically it's a cacophony, it's a, it's a very crazy space to be in sound. But what I'm mean, interested in that is how the community have been articulating themselves and what strategies they're using over the years um, in terms of you know, resistance to some process of gentrification that's healed in Peckham and how sound can tell us something about that. So how sound can tell me something about that. How can I work in this documentary from a sonic perspective without using any kind of language or discourse or verbal narrative? In this, I've been involved in some local group uh, discussions like Peckham Vision that is uh, well, the active over 20 years now. Uh, very important to articulate community in this kind of uh, discussion of the futures of the place, the futures of Peckham, and discussion about how to, to create participation on the, on the new development plans for Peckham. But also there is obvious there's no discussion about sound, so no one mentioned about that. Uh, it's something that uh, the only discussion about sound you have in this type of Meetings are uh, about noise reduction or sorry, noise noise um, regulation. It's for me is not really to stop for discussion. But uh, anyway, just to contextualize the document, there's a lot to talk about Peckham, but I want to focus on the methodological process. So the question I'm asking at the moment is how is the Asian self acoustic environment is made to contemporary documented filmmaking? Can you understand the better place of community through sound? And do past events leave the sonic trace? And how can we hear them in the presence? So those questions drive me to, and motivate and inspire me to, uh, or, uh, to develop this kind of creative toolkit in which uh, listening play an important role, the embodied experience of listening play an important role in the first few months of the project. Just listen through pack and walk between public and private space. And the technique I use is like to write down those uh, listening experiences using different techniques. So I'm not going to talk so much about the modes of listening here, but Pauline Oliveira's deep listening was a very um, important for this process. And for writing down a kind of more creative way, like poetry or something like autotonography, uh, well, uh, yeah, demand. So then find strategies to use through recording, different microphones, different techniques, working sonic pieces composition, and that kind of sonic methodological thinking will then be extended to the whole process of filming and editing process. I'm going to talk about the, what we call dialogic editing post-production in a second. Some problems and issues about sonic methods in research, I think uh, everyone here <laughs> you know, tired to know about that. They always need to rely on measurement, visual representation of graphics, um, spectrograms or scores. Uh, sound itself is very difficult to, you know, to be um, to rely on research, especially talk about listening. Uh, listening is like a memory; it's ephemeral, it's relational, it's immeasurable. You know, as soon as it's heard, it's gone. So the, the method I've been developing from practice-based research has incorporated aspects of autotonography, field recording, and film making as a way to materialize listening experience and make it suitable for analysis, studies, and creative use. As Catalan's illuminates, so recording both make and our memories ghostly trace of the past remaining time and space. This trace of the past echo and reverberate through language, place names, family stories, song, and the sound of the natural world to form a kind of sonic background to the present. Thus, autotonography, which means, from our perspective, writing, listening diaries in a kind of reflexive way, uh, reflective way. Combining field recording remains a promise technique for analyzing personal experience in order to derive understanding about broader cultural experience, according to Alice Adams and Butcher 2011. 
Um, this play, just to give a sense of what is packed in terms of sound, that's not a, those, those sounds, soft examples I'm going to play now, they're not really compositional, uh, they don't, they're not intended to be composition, but actual research process itself, when I'm doing my longer recording using binaural microphones, over an hour recording, going inside and outside the place, and then listen back and transform them in kind of, kind of sonic narrative between five and ten minutes. Uh, but just to give us a story, we by both towns of back, I suppose you move No sound? We have a sound beat on this. Sounds come from here, volumes. Not a sound thing here, is there? <clears throat> so the sound here is okay. Yeah, it's coming out from this computer. Is the computer volume down? No, it's not. Yeah, it's not. Well, uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank Yeah, it'd be very difficult to keep going from presentation without the, the sound because it doesn't make much sense, uh, especially if to finish this. Is it, is it definitely the right output on the computer? So that's okay. Is it speakers of the speakers? That's the built in speakers. Yeah. Yeah. That extra scale would be. That's a kind of That's really loud. Okay. Back, sorry about that. I think there's no time to show back and forth on Sonic. Just to give a sense of place, but then uh, those recordings are always changing, um, changing techniques and microphones as a way to try to shift my subjective experience of listening through uh, others' perspective. Also, interesting how objects' perspectives of listening can come something about that place in terms of vibrations, ontology, resonance, and reflection. 
And then this is one example using a direction microphone inside Scott for this. Uh, the main point, that, well, well, that's the point. The main point about those compositions, this listening diaries and listening experience, uh, all those sonic pieces, is then to work in the dialogic film editing process when I had a collaborate with uh, an editor and a cinematographer and send in all those materials in order to, um, to then to work like um, in response to the sonic elements. That's the idea of trying to extend sonic thinking that way. So the editor is working the film at the moment. She's trying to, she's actually had a quite a good experiment about that. I'm trying to understand how this process of extending this accessibility, some accessibility can help to reshape and, uh, yeah, reshape and recalibrate uh, documentary film strategies for an editing process um, and so on. So, active three civic listening uh, is allow the sound of sugar cane in the wind. What does it mean to learn from other people's listening experience in doing suggest to direct the sound recording, filming, and research process? Hearing stories of soundtrack hearing stories, soundtrack US military film footage, and research auto testimonies were methods applied by anthropologist Robert Cox, acoustic scientist Kozu Hiramatsu, and the sound arts Angus Carlini on their 10 years collaborative project Xalala. The long-term research concerning the long-standing problems of ill health, environmental damage, and social suffering caused by the exposure of noise pollution U.S. military jets about the U.S. military jets on the island of Okinawa, juxtaposing perspectives from ethnographic sound arts filmmaking. The research has also resulted in the film, Zawal, The Sound of Shirk and the Wind, a 15-minute experimental film blurring the boundaries between documentary art. The film clearly emphasizes aesthetic, the aesthetics and the politics of listening by amplifying sonic textures as testimonial material. Listening was adopted as a holistic process and the primary, primary methodological approach by function as a research catalyst from the project conception to creative decisions on post production. Uh, just to finish, I'd like to play a few minutes of this uh, documentary. Um, yeah, and the, another important thing here about the film, the, so they're not really into the idea again, so the sound only as a kind of vibratory movements in the air, but also how it resonates with memory, resonance and reverberation through the Okinawa's people, Okinawa's islanders, uh, in terms of the, you know, the um, US invasion, basically.
as a conclusion about um, this kind of experimental methodology process yet. Um, so the combination of sonic methods of investigation, such as listening, field recording, sound design, combined with creative writing, autotunography, and filmmaking, enables creative translation from the embodied choirs of field work to artistic practice. Doing thinking, experimenting, theorizing are dynamic process that play a constitutive role in their relation to the world through the sonic. And I will finish here, open for maybe some questions or quick seeks over there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do, you think, do you think there's a reason why documentary filmmakers don't focus as much on sound as perhaps we would expect them to? Yeah, yeah, the historical reason, but so big discussion, but yeah, there's, um, well, documentary film tradition from the 50s and 60s, uh, they are very influenced by observation of documentary, by ethnographic studies, which there's, you know, get the camera, from the Western perspective, get the camera, go, to talk about the other, collect the material, and create argumentative discourse to talk about other persons. So there's always this problem in the past, I'm not saying today, of course, there's so many contemporary documentary films experimenting a lot, but um, there's this tendency of the idea of uh, authenticity, reality, truth. And if you put music in a documentary, you're going to you know, contamine the documentary with emotion. But that's a kind of old discussion, of course, there's me, me, uh, treat me half and 30 years ago was the question what is what is such a thing as a documentary that does exist you know there's always a mediation process between the filmmaker technology and like artistic decision but on the other hand you see you know what's happened today in terms of what we call entertainment documentaries netflix documentaries or whatever that is using a lot of same techniques using fiction movie and that also is very problematic Ethically speaking, because you know, it's always manipulation a level that you never know what you. Because in the end of the day, documentary is, is a way, according to Bill, because it's a way to access some social political environment or cultural reality or historical reality, mediated by creativity, by technology, but it's a way to access something that is real. And yeah, so there's those questions. So, one type of documentary I really like it and really maybe. Um, Aligned with is um, the sense of number of Latin Harvard, Harvard, for example, they're doing this kind of documentaries. There's no voiceover, no interviews. It's from the subjective from the filmmaker. So, sorry, it's from the subjective of the sub filmmaker. Find uh, strategies on the camera, on the sound, on the post production to to transcribe that in a very sensory way. So without using language tests or or, or just visual representation. Uh, it's very sensorial documentaries. Uh, and in that sense, of course, you talk about listening, sonic methodology. This is an opportunity to sound. This is an opportunity to pluralize ways of knowledge. It's an opportunity to, uh, in some ways, question, interrogate global centric tradition of uh, research, knowledge, and, and visual oriented tradition. So I think that's a kind of discussion in documentaries. So there's uh, something between and interested. Not in those traditional observational documentaries that. You don't use news because there's sound, that's a kind of very old style of discussion. But on the other hand, you have this kind of very problematic documentaries that it's not documentary, it's just film, just something. And I think there's something between that is interest that requires research, it requires ethical position, and the ethical position using sound can be creative. Of course, it can be very creative, but also uh, not only for aesthetic proposition. And I think that's why very interesting for, for the context of my research, very interesting. Stephen Feld, even more interesting Stephen Feld than Schaefer's acoustic ecology. Uh, I think that's a kind of my position in terms of theoretical thing. Yeah, it's, it's the, the, the relative, you know, kind of filtering out of ambience. I wonder how much of it is it because of a lot of work on early wildlife recording, particularly early bird song recording. And certainly the first couple of generations of those, you know, scientists, and they used microphones, you know, parabolic reflectors and stuff like that, or carefully placed microphones to, to study 
the sound of a particular bird. Uh, I, ironically, we call them shot bird mics, which actually is not yeah. it's not yeah. unrelated to how people had studied birds to that point, which was killing them and stuffing them and putting them in a museum. Yeah. Um, but I just wonder how much of that, that because of course now if you're doing a, a lot of contemporary um, bird song recorders, actually what they're interested in is collecting what the position of that bird is within a much bigger acoustic ecosystem, if you like. Right. Well, uh, and is there, is there something of that, is there something of that heritage in in that document, the ide ideologies of like the early documentary filmmakers, where actually we're interested in this piece of information, we've got to filter everything else out. I don't think it can be restricted to that. Can be. I think I like this. Uh, I think it was Peter Kuzak quotation. Sound can be a potent yeah. trigger for, for research. Yeah. yeah. Can be very journalistic in that sense or scientific, but not necessarily. I think it sounds no more. That's the reason I don't like to. I, I try to avoid using kind of mode of listening, like listen, listen, or any kind of virtuosity of listening, because that's quite problematic for me. I was listening to Peck and then I start to, because I came from music background, I start to try. Think about sounds as objects for, for, for composition, textures, timbre, tonal. And it, that's our mindset, or my mindset, at least, uh, mostly from music uh, composers. And what I'm interested in is to listen to the everyday life sound. And that's very difficult. You need to shift your intention on a very specialized virtuoso to listen to something more that requires listening to the contingence of the present moment. And that's the kind of uh, interest when I start to write about that's much more interesting than describing sounds, much more interest in my relationship to the place. Yeah. And then it rise up a lot of those questions about social, political, cultural, environmental, and everything's connected. I think it's the most interesting thing about peak listening. It's actually all the all the sounds that are noises, as it were, are actually part of a part of listening. Yeah, I think yeah, that was a uh, yeah my first start trying yeah. deep listening to that little bit very interesting. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think uh, this is probably not relevant, but um, Dan Stahl, um, who in, in the past did amazing work with um, beatboxing and machine learning. He would use his voice to control um, a synthesizer in real time using machine learning. But interestingly, he's moved now in his research to um, using machine learning to analyze um, birds of environments. Um, with ecological implications. So I don't know. I just wonder if probably his work might be relevant. Yeah, so, definitely. Uh, Thank you. This is Dan Stahl. He's at the at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. And okay, Dan Stahl. I will have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you for this. Very interesting. All right. Uh, I really love the presentation. Um, really interested in sound, uh, sound recording, field recording especially. And what I like about your approach is getting, you mentioned before, getting the truth or getting a picture of reality of a certain space. I, I find every city in the world will have a different sonic uh, imprint, you can call it. And, and that sound is changing through time. But you mentioned something about your presence, being in the place. What is your approach? How do you, <laughs> when you're getting to the place, you are altering that space, right? Your presence is making an alteration and you put in your microphones. And I have the experience where people think uh, I'm filming for some reason, even though it's the microphones that are there. And I feel like the space changes because I'm there with the microphone. Oh, definitely. So how do you be able to capture the true essence of that environment? Oh, I don't know if it's true. Yeah, I got a question. I think there's, well, it's a kind of big discussion, try to synthesize that and think my thoughts about that. I think one thing is recording in nature, outside the urban space. That's a one very big topic of discussion. You should hide behind the microphone and should put your presence on the microphone. This kind of discussion is quite useful. For the Anthropocene area, <laughs> really. Or the other thing is, uh, is a human documentary. So, of course, when we get with microphones or even cameras, it's very, really, really invasive. And people start to ask questions, and it is a difficult negotiation. Yeah. My now can be very useful because, no, <laughs> but also very theatrical. If you, depends what you do, if you know what I mean. I can go inside church, I can go inside, listen to private conversations and record that. Yeah. 
but it's very useful to move around private and public space and connecting and no one people think I'm just a dear one. Uh, that's one stress. I try to avoid big microphones because there's always this problem of, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sometimes not. I think it depends, but um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, well, great to be here uh, virtually. Thanks, Dave, for letting me do this presentation remotely. Uh, I should uh, apologize in advance for any hiccups during this presentation, not due to the technological glitches, but mainly being me, for me being on the code day in a minute due to a slight uh, medical adventure. Nothing too serious, but it does mean I'm a little bit hazy, so apologies in advance for that. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to be talking about a, a topic, a recent topic that I stumbled upon recently and that has intrigued me uh, towards both for looking at an entirely new uh, area of research as well as something that can enhance or augment what I have been previously uh, working on, uh, which is the practice of controllerism. Uh, I should say as well that much of what I'm going to talk about are included in a book chapter uh, that was released, uh, published recently. Uh, edited by Michael Filimowicz in Designing Interaction with Music and Sound. Uh, so, um, so, some of you uh, might know me uh, from my previous work that I work a lot with interactive sound and dancers. Uh, combining. Sorry, is someone trying to say something? No, go ahead. Great. Sorry, I keep hearing some artifacts. Uh, so, I have been working a lot with uh, dancers and combining interactive sound with motion sensors and gestural controllers. And for about the past 10, 11 years or so, and I have worked with uh, a range of performers, uh, ranging from performing actors, uh, performing artists, actors, dancers, and so on. Um, what's lesser known uh, about my musical past is that for quite a few years I was also a disc jockey. Um, here I am in about 2007 with a much worse haircut, albeit quite a few kilograms lighter as well, I should say. Uh, so this is a practice that, although uh, that had marked me from a very early age, is something I have completely forgotten when I started moving away from my popular music and postgraduate studies and into my uh, undergraduate studies and into my postgraduate studies. And that uh, moving on to that area, the new area, is was a sort of an entirely new uh, field for me to uh, explore and in many ways I thought that this is an opportunity for me to erase my uh, past. And so this uh, chapter that I started writing in 2020 was an opportunity to reflect on some of my past practices and uh, really answer the question on uh, an imaginary conversation with someone who was trying to figure out what it is that I do. So in that question, with my current practice, that is uh, working with dancers, performing artists and so on, uh, there is no really use what we do, uh, which is a collective uh, work, um, pretty much on unequal terms, notwithstanding some differences in um, our respective roles in terms of sound design or movement and so on. Uh, then the next is uh, the what, and um, really here was me trying to myself as a composer, a producer, a recordist, a disc jockey, a sonic artist, and really just many, many um, adjectives in trying to avoid calling myself a musician because I was someone that did not have a formal musical education and I thought this is something that I should not call myself. Uh, so my answer really uh, at this question was I perform live music and do so by manipulating sounds through operating dials, buttons, and switches on digital devices as well as also using motion sensors that were worn by my collaborators. And so I was quite happy with this really in eloquent um, description. Uh, and then I came to realize that this is something that is related to a practice that's been going on for quite a few years, which is that of controllerism. And uh, which also is a far more eloquent way to describe one. But that's something that evaded me during my sort of scholarly years because it's something that is not been written in uh, there's no there's very little academic writing on controllerism and mainly the what's available out there is mostly reduced to um, master thesis and PhD um, uh, thesis as well so this was an opportunity to do a um, sort of 
a literary, firstly, a literary view on controllerism and what's available out there, and I also try to contextualize my previous practice with dancers within the, um, the context of controllerism. So I'll start just by quickly explaining some of the background of uh, the practice before moving on to my own practice. So, um, so controllerism really, uh, this is something as a term that started by Matt Moldover in about 2007, 2008. And he describes it as the art of manipulating sounds and creating music live using computer controllers and software, simple as that. And then Michael Anthony Derrico, in his PhD thesis, uh, describes the practice as electronic musicians who use hardware controllers to manipulate software in performance. Now, um, Matt Moldover as well, in terms of um, uh, explaining why he picked up that name, uh, he explains that this comes from turntablism, the practice of turntablism. And this seems, and he says that this seems are essentially the same idea, but they resolve around different instruments. But like DJs who empathize performance and approach the tools as musical instruments, they differentiate themselves from DJs who just play records, and that's referring to turntables as opposed to disc jockeys. And he goes to say, in the same way, performers who use computer technologies as musical instruments in either the way to differentiate themselves from people who check their emails. And this is really one of the first quips uh, that I kept finding when I was researching this topic. Uh, there's always this uh, sort of suspicion about uh, using computers in music performance as almost a way of cheating. Um, this is in many ways a sort of, um, a sort of cultural baggage uh, that comes from, uh, the, um, from, from the practice of DJ. And I should really uh, differentiate here what I'm talking about is that a DJ is someone that plays pre-recorded songs, uh, mix them together for performance or recording. Um, the aim is to balance the mix songs in terms of tempo and frequencies, be using uh, a sort of a mixer equipment and so on. Whereas a turntable is used scratching and manipulation of sound and samples to create a sole composition that is as much an original creation as the sound that is used um, for creating that. Uh, so. Uh, Mark Hatt as well explains uh, that the seriousness of the, the differentiation between the two. And he says that is turntable is more than a suffix, it's a crucial signifier that lends a sense of seriousness to the art. And there's a common perception about art that is that they just simply play records, reproducing rather than creating music. Yet turntables, as they often assert, are musicians, instrumentalists in their own right. So this is really um, what we're seeing as a way of using uh, technology in music performance. And of course, within our field in electronic composition and so on, we know that the use of technology in music has been going on for many, many years. However, in popular music, it only emerged, um, well, it emerged at a much later point than in the other field. So really, the point that we can see this uh, is about in the 19, uh, towards the end of the 60s with King Toby. Uh, who was um, he, he was one of the uh, many producers in Kingston, Jamaica, where they were um, pressing records of uh, reggae music. And as it was uh, the trend of the time, they would create a version for to be used as a B-side. And King Toby took that uh, form of creating a version, which in his most uh, basic form um, was just omitting the vocals. But he used some extended techniques um, with equalization, delays, uh, reverb, flanging, and so on, um, in order to create a, something that was quite distinct from the original aesthetics of the reggae song. Now, what's interesting about this is that King, um, related to the topic, is that King Toby was actually not uh, a musician. Uh, he, he was described as a radio repairman, a vinyl recordist, a mixing engineer, and so on. However, with the um, um, with the work that he created, he was able to elevate the position of the mixing engineer or someone that works in a technical capacity to that of an artist in his own right. And so and this is also further reflected to the development of hip hop music, with Cool DJ Heck, who was also a compatriot of uh, King Tubby, uh, being someone that had no formal musical training, then he, but he went to create um, well, pretty much the genre hip hop, or at least the very early. Um, areas of its development and develop some uh, techniques on the turntable that will go actually and um, establish the whole practice of turntablism. So, uh, 
What is interesting here is how both of them were not musicians. Um, this is something that I have, um, I have been reflecting on as well. Well then, so can no musicians create music? Um, and this is a, a different conversation in many ways. Uh, so I will just move on quickly uh, to just show a couple of examples of controllerism technique uh, practice. So the first one I'll show is comes from Tim, Tim Exile, which in many ways he can be considered the, um, the, the real pioneer of controllerist practice even before Moldova coined the term. So this is a performance from 2005, is a studio performance. So uh, this is just to uh, show just an example of controllerist practice and then th we can see obviously of something that we're probably all familiar with, it's just a heap of controllers all uh, sending information and um, coming from the performer onto our software system. And uh, at the same time, there's a, we're quite clear, we're quite usual of this format, there's a table strewn full of equipment. And then on the other side we have a technique uh, that's performed by Arab music here which is quite different in many ways, but also quite similar. So, the, in terms of uh, the different similarities between the two, uh, what is uh, what I'm trying to concentrate here in identifying those different similarities is the level of virtuosity evident in those performances. And uh, in many ways, the the one from Arab music, the one with the finger drumming that you just saw now, is concentrating on the actual performance and accuracy in the inputs, whereas the inputs are fairly simple in terms of a pressing of one of those uh, drum pads will generate a sound. In the, but so it's more kind of like how close can this performance come to that of a real drummer, something that we can recognize as something uh, that includes virtuosity and a particular skill. On the other hand, the one by Team Exile is mostly about the, the virtuosity can be seen in the performance to a certain extent, but also to the instrument design. Now, the, one of the problems here is that Whereas Arab music is fairly understandable, it's very legible what is happening, uh, that is the connection between sound generation and, um, and uh, performer input, in the, in the case of Tim Exiles is a little bit more obscure, as other, because of the, the result of that is we don't quite know what uh, connection uh, the performer is doing, uh, how is that, what input the performer is doing and how is that connected to the, um, to the resulting sound. Now, uh, and even Tim So actually says uh, in the, later in the video that the, the system does include a panic button uh, that explains that during the performance you will often reach a state of such sonic complexity that the outcome of his inputs could not be predicted and the panic button will initialize the system back to a comprehensible stage. So really, it, it, the problem here is that this virtuosity can be diluted to an observer. However, from another perspective, it could be the case that the system here acts generatively, with the controller is now acting as a catalyst whose input coaxes the system into areas that may be unpredictable. 
So uh, perhaps we can say that the virtuosity here is that not only the performers, but also the creator of the instrument and the options that this allows the performer for improvisation. Now, comparing, uh, I, I wanted to compare now these uh, such examples of controllerist practices with uh, ones more common with sort of, let's say, academic music. And um, two, two that I found that are of particular interest in, particular interest would be uh, live coding and acoustic diffusion or live specialization of music. And really, w when it came to uh, diffusion, which again, I'm sure most people in this room will be familiar with, it is, uh, although it's clearly a performance medium, there is a trend nowadays which I have discussed with other colleagues uh, that we're moving away from live uh, diffusion of sound and into ambisonic arrangements or multi-channel arrangements. So really what little performance was left in uh, this style of music is now uh, bereft. And perhaps one of the reasons we're doing this is because we're trying to have the perfect format and we're trying to recreate it perfectly every time in different environments. Uh, I'm sure a lot would disagree with me at this point. Uh, but I'm going to go <laughs> with it uh, for, for the moment. And then when it comes to live coding, uh, the, the problem with live coding is, although it's very much a performance, it very much requires the manual input of the uh, performer in order to generate sound, the relation between those inputs and the sonic manipulation is even more obscured uh, than those in the controllers practice, uh, which, okay, they can uh, they are projecting the lines of code, but then and as, as unless the audience are able to decipher and understand what that code means and how that code manipulates sound and creates sound, it will be quite difficult to understand the direct connection. Uh, so in in discussing these uh, these two different performance mediums, um, I also want to um, bring you back on an article written by uh, Van Veen and Tobias Atias uh, on talking about controllerism, which goes back at least 10 years now, this article, uh, where we're trying to um, explain how uh, modern technologies, digital technologies, are able to um, either hinder or advance uh, the uh, DJ practice. Got a five-minute warning. <laughs> Five minutes? Yeah. Okay, that came early. So, uh, they started uh, discussing about the sonic performative possibilities, uh, those that go digital, that are the possible practical environments, such as looping, cue point, juggling. And the point here is not to diminish the virtuosity of a turntable, it's rather to understand that virtuosity, if it's perceived as virtuosity at all. Now, uh, another, uh, another where, where I was looking at more literature on controllerism, I came across something that Holly Herden discussed, which is um, she appreciates the uh, nerdiness, as she calls it, that goes into controllerism and the research of it. But the problem here was that it's too new for people and something they're not able to understand in terms of uh, the technology involved. But how, how that differs from turntable was that the turntable and the vinyl was something that was a household item at the time when turntable was emerging as a practice, so people were able to understand it. Uh, so, um, the problem with controllers nowadays is that those technologies are not uh, quietly uh, understood. They're not as, uh, they're not household items, uh, MIDI controllers. However, what, uh, and I'm just trying to run through with the five minute warning that we have. What's of interest here is that the, there is quite a big um, move in music education at the minute to include more um, DJ, um, DJing in as a syllabus in, um, for undergraduate studies. So the controllers is a way to expand this area and actually include more, uh, more diverse music technologies in music education with systems that are fairly understandable and fairly approachable. Uh, so, uh, I've got quite a bit to say on my uh, on my own performance, but I will just have to run through it very very quickly. What uh, what I'll say very quickly is that um, talking about virtuosity is about 
it, that relates to something that um, is quite often said in uh, interactive dance, which is about transparency of interaction, which is a finding for the audience being able to identify a direct relationship between movements and the musical consequences. And this is something that I claim control it does perfectly. And um, by using uh, dancers as controllers themselves, uh, well, by using motion sensors, the, we are able to almost magnify the movements the fingers do on the controllers on, on the exact, on the stage. And um, this is, uh, I'm going to, I had a very short video to play, uh, I'm just going to, let it uh, play while I'm speaking. And um, what this you can see here is a combination of a dancer moving with motion sensors and myself performing on a controller. Now, what I wanted to point out here is that this the system here operate. Um, if I was to not give some of the um, sonic uh, manipulation capabilities to the dancer, perhaps the performance would have been better. It would have been more accurate. However, that's the opposite of what this performance aims to achieve, which is to present the outcomes of a collaboration between two different performers. So, mapping movement data to sound affecting parameters, results in modulation are radically different to those achieved through means usually available to controllers. So, the speed, range, and change of direction of our movements uh, generate data that would be impossible to produce with finger gestures. And uh, that's also the case in using modulation devices, LFOs, type sequences, and so on. Uh, so, in many, so, so, just two final points. Uh, the, by assigning controls of news parameters to a dancer's actions provides a, a cultural context for their virtuosity to become perceptible by audiences or other viewers. So, the gestures of uh, fingers on the controllers are translated and magnified onto a stage throughout the, bodies, uh, throughout the dancer's body. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, it, the low accuracy of the motion sensors and the natural imperfections of the human input uh, add also some sort of level of risk to the performance, which is something that uh, Van Wien Artias has discussed extensively as an um, intricate element of performing live, particularly with, uh, when it comes to DJs, when it comes to controllers or other electronics. Um, perhaps some of you might have heard the uh, performance I recorded that was played earlier this morning and that it did include quite a few mistakes uh, but I see nothing wrong with them. Uh, there's no point uh, chasing a perfect version of a, uh, a perfect version of a performance and those mistakes are actually what humanizes and actually what uh, provides uh, a performance and actually what provides perhaps a point of reference for audiences to be um, to see it as a more approachable, um, something that can be understood in better ways. Um, so, just to uh, just to close that, if I have a two more minutes, is that okay? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll be very, very quick, I promise. Uh, so, just that, uh, as a final point, let's see if I can move this slide, there we go. So, in many ways, controller's practice encompasses a democratization. Uh, it becomes, the technology becomes, in many ways, a democratizing agent here. So, from uh, Delera Blanes' uh, master thesis, uh, he discusses uh, with uh, Petro Cocanao the prejudice of microphones affording a fair advantage to vocalists. And they say that um, there is a result as something not worse, no better, just different. Uh, it's seen as a proper summation. So the world does not belong to those with better vocal projection, but to those that can touch us through their voice. Uh, that is what we want to hear, feeling. And controllers allows us just that, to express with feeling, be it by interpreting keys, or a beat, or whatever else we choose to express. So it is this democratization where the power of controllerism and um, the power as a new evolutionary definition of design lies. Uh, so the reality is not that everyone can understand what an algorithm it is, let alone program one, or even let's utilize it for artistic expression. And in contrast, anyone can press a button, flick a switch, twist a dial, move a fader along his rails, and therefore understand the corresponding motion. And if the consequence of that motion is the creation of sound in real time, we have reached the aforementioned example 
or for guitarist plucking a string that is in the direct relation between um, performer input and sound. So if we combine this rudimentary um, element with the rhythmical awareness, like the dedication to develop muscle memory transverse swiftly across uh, tactile controls and the ability to understand manufacturing instructions for using software and hardware products, pretty much anyone can become a controllerist. So, uh, thanks for listening. And just a, just a closing thing, one of the problems with controllers nowadays is that, as opposed to turntablism, there's no established transcription or evaluation techniques. Whereas we have um, established a transcription for turntablism, one future direction that I'm looking to expand this on is developing a similar system for controllerism. So, thanks for listening, and apologies if some of this was uh, slightly bubbling at times. Okay, thank you, Noli. Uh, in the interest of time, we, we were supposed to end at, uh, at 25, right? Okay, uh, so say if you, if you really need to go, go, but if you want to stick around and questions, uh, Manoli, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll stick around, so. Uh, if, if anyone has questions, perhaps I'll, I'll just relay them, I think. Because you probably can't hear all the way back. Okay. Question from Mark. I'm interested in the um, working with the dancer and whether the dancer had a long time to work with the system and if it was programmed or if it was improvised. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And I was going to address it if I didn't run out of time. Uh, in, in fact, we have three different modes of interaction and one. Um, the one that you saw in the video involves a quite high level of awareness, so the dancer will have to familiarize themselves with the system quite well and almost perform it like an instrument. But however, there are other modes of interaction that uh, they can have a very low level of understanding or even a moderate one. And of course, that will result in different modes of performance, such as um, free improvisation or a complete choreographed performance. Other questions? Simon. Uh, can you hear me at all? From yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Um, so, uh, really, really interesting talk. Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, Thank you. I wondered if you happen to be familiar with um, uh, Courtney Brown and Garth Payne stuff on Argentinian tango. So, basically, they had people really, really into Argentinian tango, and they put um, motion sensors on their ankles. And um, in many expressive ways, the way that they dance um, drove uh, the accompaniment. Basically, there was a sort of generated, um, you know, uh, accompaniment, and they did some quite interesting stuff with that. So, um, just don't know if that's relevant. But um, second question, if I may, is um, or observation is: Do you think that at Spigowski stuff on um, in, embodiment, embodied cognition. You, you know, this, this business of interpreting what the controllerist is doing and finding it meaningful, you know, and the lack of any existing notation is maybe Spigowski stuff on embodied cognition in music relevant to that, do you think? Um. Yeah, um, from what I could hear, I, I think uh, I do remember this uh, performance with Tango. I think I saw it in a nine paper, um, which uh, I haven't had a chance to read through out of it. Uh, is it the Machine Tango performance that you're talking about? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the. I'm not sure if that's the same paper or not. Um, okay. But um, this was in the book um, Music and Human Computer Interaction, in fact. But it, it obviously. I don't know if it's the same or different work, but maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, in terms of the embodiment, uh, I mean, uh, again, I'm not 100%, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that my um, pharmaceuticals allow me to recall that particular publication right now. But w what I would say is with a system that we enacting, the performer is able to either uh, uh, dig quite deep and become quite intimate with the system and understand it wholly and able to perform it with a quite high level of control. Or they can just ignore it entirely and just concentrate on the virtuosity of a dance performance. 
And then, of course, the system will react in different ways. One will be something that can be choreographed, it's something that can be planned quite well and have a determinate effect, a uh, determinate outcome, or it can be treated as a generative system, something that just creates modulation almost randomly and then creates an uh, indeterminate uh, outcome. Um, I don't know if this answers your question, sorry, I couldn't hear you very well either. I guess what I was thinking partly, and I may be going up the wrong tree here, but I was thinking partly, um, certainly I think it's a wonderful idea for the audience to understand what's going on through a dance, right? I think that's yeah. a idea. But um, at the same time, if you think of the sort of, I don't know, the, the intersection with live coding and, um, and yeah. um, then if an audience is trying to interpret what the controller is, is doing, the motions that they're doing. It could be, I don't know, could it be that thinking about embodied cognition could help to find ways of making that connection more sort of apparent? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same question in do we think uh, seeing a pianist playing a piano, uh, do we pay attention to the movements or is it just a combination of the sound and the movement together? Uh, the, the, the difference between such an acoustic instrument performance and something like the one that I showed is really that uh, one, there is a cultural context that we understand. We know what a piano will sound like when you're pressing it down. Uh, when it comes to all the technology used in those performances, that becomes diluted. Uh, so whether the audience are able to um, deduct this, deduct what the input is on a controller and what the sound re resulting is, I'm not quite sure that happens. But the, the dancer will help in maybe putting uh, attention away from the controller and onto the performer. Lovely topic, thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you.